everybody. Lovely to see you all. I'm sorry that we can't be there in person today, but greetings from sunny Glasgow. Uh, we're going to be with you um, live online for the Q&A, so we'll be able to chat with some of you then, hopefully. So today we're going to be talking about a project that we are partway through. We've just finished the pilot phase and we've named this project the Storied Land. You're going to meet all three of the Glasgow-based uh, project members today. Um, I am Nicole Smith, a lecturer in museum education in the School of Education at the University of Glasgow. Uh, Lizzie Robertson is here um, as a PhD candidate within archaeology and Gareth Beale is a lecturer in digital archaeology. So we have 20 minutes to talk to you about a pilot project and we're going to begin with a short context and background and then give you an overview of our design process and talk to you about some of the prototypes that we've created and then briefly um, cover some of the lessons learned and next steps. So over to Gareth. Okay, yeah, so the project has um, origins in some other work that uh, Nicole and I and colleagues at um, University of York at Digital Creativity Lab are involved in, um, specifically the Viking VR project within the walls of York Jail and the Digital Creativity Regional Museums project. And each of these projects was about how we use emerging media technologies within a cultural heritage context, specifically in that instance within museums. So. But underpinning the entire project was how can we get past the hype of some of these technologies, um, which at the time of this project were uh, very hypey around VR, mixed reality and those kinds of things. Um, how can we get past some of those messages about these technologies being transformational and uh, in themselves extremely innovative and really get back to a sense of what we as cultural heritage professionals, researchers, museum practitioners, uh, cultural heritage managers or whatever, um, want from this technology so obviously the things that we're trying to do on a day-to-day -day basis aren't dictated by what new technologies are available we need to uh, use technologies to serve our own purposes so these projects were all about how we can embed some of these experiences within museums to improve museums um, and to enhance the kinds of things that museums are really excellent at doing already rather than trying to say, you know, you've got to do things differently now because there's a new technology available, which really isn't what we should be doing. We shouldn't be allowing our work to be led by technology. Um, so we learned uh, quite a lot of different things um, uh, within those projects. Um, and some of them were the things we sort of hoped would, you know, some of them were genuinely unexpected. So. A few of these things really captivated us and sort of led into this work in some ways. Uh, and they were around um, the kinds of communities of practice which you find within um, uh, museums and cultural heritage organisations, and specifically the fact that, um, for one, you find a whole load of skills within these kinds of organisations, and you'll all know this, having worked with these organisations, I'm sure, um, which you didn't necessarily expect to find. So um exhibition design isn't a whole lot different to game design you're coping with unruly people walking through environments and non-linear pathways and all these kinds of things so these kinds of uh what we'd associate with being digital uh media skills like non-linear storytelling and that kind of thing actually there's a huge amount of expertise already present within cultural heritage organizations uh we also um and this sort of leads into number three on this slide a little bit found that cultural heritage organizations of different kinds act as an amazing center point for practice so as well as having all this expertise locally um they provide space they provide focus they provide subject matter they provide um all of this great stuff which enables interesting work to happen so when we were working at york we really found very quickly that co a, a community of practice which uh, included university museum people but also included musicians, artists, creative people of all kinds, teachers, a whole load of different people coalesced around this project and found a natural home at the museum doing this kind of work. And so this kind of dynamic, kind of responsive community of practice idea is something that uh, really, uh, um, uh, we, we really liked. And it is something that was very effective within that project and definitely something we want to take forwards. Um, 
And I think um, the uh, other things I want to talk about, which is detailed on the slide. So um, doing this kind of work as genuine co-design participatory work can lead the use of technology in very interesting and unusual directions. So for technologies finding relevance within a museum setting, it can be features of the technology that you wouldn't necessarily identify if you were thinking about someone using VR in their lounge to play tennis or whatever. It's a completely different kind of, uh, uh, it's a completely different set of criteria. And so um, it really allows us as creative people, but as practitioners in this area to take hold of the technology and sort of redirect it, reuse it, appropriate it and use it in our own way. Um, and I think this idea of arts and culture as a focus for innovation is really important to us. So uh, the kinds of uses to which technology are put really dictates the way in which technology develops. And that can be top down development sometimes of what technologies are developed, what becomes available. But of course, we, museums aren't likely to be able to sort of dictate how Samsung developed their VR offerings or whatever. But um, it can also be localized, this kind of DIY technological development. How do we actually use technologies locally? And we found within this work that quite a lot of interesting uses of technology began to um, emerge around how we use these kinds of systems. Um, so that was a really quick skim through them. Uh, can we move on to uh, the next slide then, which is you, I think, and how some of these ideas sort of map on. Yeah, thanks, Gareth. That's really um, interesting to to hear that overview and think about, think back to those lessons learned from those three projects and think about how that's kind of, that journey has led us to this, this point. Um, and I guess there are kind of three things that came out of those projects that relate to our kind of current practice. So all three of us, you know, work in a, on, a, on a very kind of landscape scale, um, you know, being kind of archaeologists who also are interested in digital interpretation um, and how we use that for formation of expressions of heritage. And so I think these are kind of the three points really that are kind of underpinning this next stage, this kind of pilot project that we worked on. And those are all around thinking about immersive storytelling at a landscape scale. So the kind of basic question behind that is how do you deploy the kind of thing that we were doing within a museum's context, which are, you know, really bounded spaces outside. So where are the kind of challenges there? And that is, you know, there are challenges there that are practical, but also there are challenges that are maybe more related to theory um, or, or, or kind of policy decisions or funding. Um, and I guess the other thing is we really became very interested in these distributed communities of practice, you know, coming coming up for a short period of time or existing for a long longer. And so what what how would those work if we were away from um, spaces where museums tend to be so within, you know, a kind of urban uh, environment perhaps or within a uh, town um so how what's the kind of difference when you go to places that maybe don't have such large populations available and how do those communities form the other thing that we really wanted to look at was how those experiences could empower opportunities um so create these kind of empowering opportunities for communities um and that you know previously the projects were looking very much at co-design from an organizational perspective so us working with museum professionals and practitioners and looking at how those relationships could form and i think the next stage of this is then thinking about other communities and other stakeholders so introducing our pilot project, the storied land. So this is um, something that we conceive to look at the potential of digital storytelling within these cultural landscapes. And this was funded by the HRC. Um, uh, so it's a um, impact accelerator award funded project. And we worked this project up in partnership with National Trust for Scotland. So this was with Michael Toway, who heads up uh, research and engagement at National Trust for Scotland. And for this work, we focus on a particular property, particular site um, within the care of National Trust for Scotland, and that is Balmacara. So Balmacara is um, a large active crofting estate. Um, it's uh, further to the uh, northwest of Glasgow, but not far from us, um, about two hours by, by car, um, and really is just a, a beautiful, um, very inspiring location. So I'm just going to give you an overview of the design process that we used. 
We're about halfway through the presentation, so we're going to give a quick overview and then talk to you about some of our prototypes. So we began with a process of exploration, working with the site manager, Ian at Balmakara, and talking to him and uh, other staff and volunteers about the way that people were engaging with Balmakara, challenges, um, opportunities there, and, and had some really wonderful time um, at the site exploring, physically exploring the location. We then chose together some principles for design. And these were principles that we stuck with throughout, um, although these will iteratively change as we continue this process and come back to exploration. We then generated ideas across the whilst working across the property and created some prototypes. And from that, we went back to NTS and spoke to um, various members of staff there, including um, senior curators, um, digital project managers, senior heritage learning advisors, head of marketing, heritage planning, various um, people with different roles within the organization to evaluate and talk about the next stage of exploration. So our design principles are that whatever we do, it has to be technologically simple. We have to use established technologies to create these magical experiences. And we're going to ensure that whatever we produce is robust, reliable and future proof. We want to be site specific and site sympathetic. So use good digital design to create experiences that will enhance rather than be dis rather than be kind of distracting of the experiences of landscape. We want to use creative interfaces, um, create user experiences of digital media that are not let down by poor user interface and create something that's reliable and um, extensible. So how can we create something that can be reused, updated, adapted and repurposed at different sites? We also want to use an inclusive design approach. Great, so I'm going to pass over to Lizzie, who's going to talk about our two prototypes. Um, we've got about five minutes to go through those and then talk to you about our lessons learned. Thanks. And thanks, Nicole. Um, yeah, so kind of looking at this idea of taking an idea of of um, the sort of prototype and, and applying this to two different settings or two different kind of audiences, um, we tried to prototype a couple of different means of doing that. So uh, the first one that I'm going to talk to you here about is the Finding the Gilly Do, um, which is an audiovisual adventure uh, story aimed at, at a younger audience. Um, and so the narrative would be kind of driven with these kind of strong links of landscape and place. Um, it doesn't necessarily require you to be at site. Um, it can be experienced kind of before your visit to Valmacara or um, whilst you're there or, you know, to sort of consider after you've been there. So it has this sort of flexibility around it. Um, and we wanted the interface to be kind of minimally digital. So we had the idea that it would be a box of postcards that you would have um, that um, it, as part of the sort of narrative, you've been left by a relative many, many years ago. And each postcard is going to give you sort of access to the next step in the narrative via a QR code. Um, and this will link to a short film. Um, so each of these postcards will link to different sites on the estate, uh, kind of linking the sort of re the narrative into the real environment. Um, so I guess we've kind of got this sort of layer of narrative upon this sort of landscape as well. Um, so the postcards is going to feature um, places in the landscape, but you don't really need to necessarily be there to unlock the sort of content, I guess, but um, the invitations to explore, um, you know, these sites that are kind of um, compelled by this very site specific narrative as well. Um, and so the story itself is um, a social and ecological history of um, the site told via a series of postcards and films, um, which we can see here on the screen. Um, and this kind of uh, story was, um, it, well, the, the adventure was undertaken by a relative about a hundred years before 
before you've come to visit the site um, when when they were young. Um, and it will kind of be about a sort of deepening awareness of the place and links between its ecological and cultural life. And the Gilly Do itself is um, is a folkloric uh, character from from uh, Scottish um, culture, Gaelic culture. Um, he has um, a fondness for the um, the trees and lichens and mosses which he covers himself in, and he's particularly um, yeah. So it's it's kind of related to to children as well. So this idea of being kind of youthful and and visiting the Gilly Do is kind of um, entrenched in this story. Um, and yeah, it's hoping to sort of revolve around a mystery that you've got to solve with the help of the Gilly Do, uh, who's been met by your relative when you when he was younger or they were younger and, and is still present now to help you complete the story. Um, and then our next uh, approach uh, quite different, but still kind of using this postcard type or, you know, handout card element. Um, it's more of a sort of aimed at older audiences, but can be kind of approached by, we think, kind of groups of people um, and of all ages. Um, and it's a mindfulness trail and an invitation to stop and listen and breathe. So these collection of cards which celebrate uh, aspects of Balmacara's natural, built and intangible heritage, um, this will all be incorporated into the sort of uh, visual and audio elements of of um, the content that will be triggered through the QR code. Um, so the paper prototypes include creative responses to the estate, such as poems, drawings, um, and as I say, this sort of QR code will trigger audiovisual content. Um, and the under the oak, under the ancient oak card uh, contains audio. This is the one that we've kind of prototyped so far, which takes the listener on a journey to find the ancient woodland of the uh, the Colivor. A narrator uh, describes a specific walk taken in the heat of the summer and encourages a consciousness of our own sort of surroundings when outdoors. And we have binaural sounds from inside the oak tree, and these are mixed with sort of spoken narrative to create a sort of multi-layered soundscape. Um, and sort of a list of prompts kind of focus in on the minutia of trees. Um, so that's what we did with that one. So I will pass back to the next person. Okay, okay, that's me. Yeah, so um, from working on these projects and from talking to Ian Turnbull, and uh, uh, Michael Tewe up at um, Balmakara, we've got this really clear sense of two things, really, which sort of justified um, the uh, uh, continuation of this work. One was that cultural landscapes are uh, uh, full of amazing stories, which have the uh, potential to enable deep relationships with place. And I think one of the um, challenges they raised was that at a lot of um, cultural heritage sites, the narrative is very straightforward because it's already been um, established what the core narratives are. But in cultural landscapes, where there are lots of people living and farming and working, cultural heritage is a much more complicated thing. But um, by working with local communities, it's possible to tell these stories, which brings me to the second point on this slide, which is that communities within these landscapes are inherently by their nature uh, creative and resourceful because they're engaged in tons of creative activity already um, and also because of the kinds of uh, uh, environments within which they live and work on a everyday basis. So a really similar picture in some ways to working in the middle of a city like York but in a very different way. Um, but in the same way as at York in order to harness this we need to think about how, um, uh, how the creative and economic opportunities uh, can be made to harness some of this. So it's all very well to say that these skills are present, but it's a completely different thing to create a context within which those skills can be applied and uh, results can be achieved. Um, and so what we're aiming to do within our work is to create a community of practice within which these skills can be um, applied to um, digital innovation, innovation in the way in which we tell stories as cultural heritage researchers and practitioners, and uh, giving control to local communities 
um, regarding the way in which these very complex, nuanced landscapes are interpreted. And I think the kinds of paper prototypes that we produced just provided a sort of brief glimpse or a small glimpse into what these kinds of systems and platforms and stories might look like as these kinds of technologies uh, develop within the culture, uh, within the context of this um, uh, culture of culture, but also um, within the context of these kinds of cultural landscapes. I used the word cultural lot then, didn't I? And then uh, we've got the, uh, you can go on to the next piece, Nicole. Um, so the next steps of this project then, and the way in which we're developing this work, and we'd love to talk to anyone about this, is to develop a uh, reusable, um, flexible storytelling system, which allows us to develop some of this infrastructure, but creates a space within which a lot of this storytelling can happen. So we can welcome other people into that space without dictating too much the form that these stories take. Uh, and that will enable community skills development. And uh, will also enable, as long as we're sort of reflexive and dynamic about this, both partners, you know, National Trust for Scotland, but also um, researchers, ways in which to create new opportunities to support the sustainability of these communities with which we're working. And then finally, yeah, so we're uh, on the uh, road towards developing this prototype now, but we really wanted to present this work at this stage because I think it's a really important uh, moment really for the development of uh, this kind of work. And um, it represents a sort of self-contained piece of work in some uh, important ways which we wanted to feed back to you on and then as the project develops and as we move towards having a uh, more fully robust system we will come back and talk to you again about all of this so um, thank you for your time and we'll now take any questions you may have for us thank you thanks